Hello, my name is Dr. Margaret Harper, and I'm looking forward to introducing you to the basics of French classic organ music. This series of videos is designed to work together to introduce you to the major genres and stylistic elements of French classic organ music. Each episode focuses on one composer and is generally graded in difficulty. This is the final video in the series, and it focuses on the music of Nicolas de Grigny. Our other episodes examine the music of François Couperin and Pierre Dumage. I'm delighted to be able to demonstrate this music for you on an organ inspired by and built in the style of a French classic organ by Jean Bédiet. There is tremendous benefit to studying music on the sort of instrument that originally inspired its composition. After all, a truly excellent organ is often the best teacher of all. Though Nicolas de Cligny lived a short life of only 31 years, he is often regarded as the greatest of the French classic organ composers. His life spanned 1672 through 1703, which makes him an approximate contemporary of both François Couperin and Pierre Dumage. These three composers share a couple important features in common. Each was born into a musical family, and each lived in the heyday of the French classic style, whose genres and customs had already been firmly established. Grigny was born into a family legacy of organists. His father, grandfather, and uncle all held church organist posts. Grigny also had the advantage of an excellent musical education. He most likely studied with Nicolas Lebeg around the same time as several other important organists, including Jean-Francois Dandru and Henri d'Anglebert. Grigny held two significant positions in his short career, at the Abbey of Saint-Denis outside Paris and at Notre-Dame de Rheine. Around a year before his death, Grigny accepted an additional position in Rheine at saint symphorien a parish church. While Grigny's life was short, his work had a significant impact on his contemporaries and on later organists and composers. His Livre d'Orgue has served as a model for other composers over the centuries since it was written. Despite its length, both Johann Gottfried Walter and Johann Sebastian Bach copied out the entire volume by hand. Both of these volumes survive and provide an interesting commentary on the way that two other composers learned from and interacted with Grigny's Livre d'Orgue. The fact that we have an entire hand copy intact from both of these composers is a testament to how highly they thought of Grigny's writing. Indeed, there is a sense in which Grigny's Livre d'Orgue is the culmination of the traditional form of its genre. It follows all the customary formats, with most alternatum versets beginning with a plein jeu verset and ending with a dialogue sur le grand jeu, and yet each form is stretched to its potential. In the Curie versets, instead of a commande entire, Grigny writes a commande entire à tout parti, that is, with two solo voices on the commande instead of just one. His tierce entire in the Gloria versets is among the most extraordinary of that form. The plein jeu at the beginning of the Pange Lingua versets defies the established custom by adding many ornaments. The dialogue sur le grand jeu from his Ave Maristella verses contains not only the usual two manuals alternating for registrations, but four distinct alternating sounds. The more time one spends with Grigny's Livre d'Orgue, the more it seems the most elevated statement of the French classic style. While the entirety of Grigny's Livre d'Orgue is exceptional, today we will use his versets on the hymn Ave Maristella as the focus of our study. Much like the Couperin and Dumage examples discussed in our two prior episodes, 
Grigny's Ave Mara Stella is bookended by a plein jeu and a dialogue sur le grand jeu, with colorful character pieces in between. Let's begin with the plein jeu. We are fortunate to have many original sources of commentary on registration and style available for French classic organ music due to the large number of composers who wrote systematic prefaces in their organ collections. Between these sources, there are a number of differences on various topics. However, they agree about the style of the Grand Plein Jeu. This is to be played in a stately manner with no ornaments except on the first chord. This seems to be due to the nature of the actual sound created by the plein jeu, which does not respond well to fast motion. In the plein jeu from Grigny's Ave Mara Stella, as well as several other plein jeu versets in his Livre d'Or, the manuscript is replete with ornaments and passing tones. The chant melody is found in the pedal, intended to be played on either the trumpet alone or the trumpet and clarin together. This means the pedal does not play the lowest voice, but instead this role is taken by the left hand. In the manuals, the composer gives us not only harmonic developments that seem to march steadily forward with unusual sense of directness, but also a filigree of trills and mordants that adorn this usually austere style. Next in Grigny's Ave Mara Stella, we have a fugue. Here we find an extraordinary intricacy of part writing, including a fugue subject that's filled with elaborate ornamentation. Grigny indicates that the right hand, with its two fugal voices, should be played on the cornet. The cornet is one of the most ubiquitous sounds on a French classic organ. It's a compound stop, which means that each single key on the keyboard plays multiple pipes. The cornet is the only compound stop on a French classic organ that is made entirely of flute pipes. All four divisions of this organ have a cornet. Because this combination of sounds is most often used in the treble range, the cornet on the grand org, the récit, and the echo divisions are all missing the lowest notes on the keyboard. In Grigny's Ave Maristella Fugue, against the right hand's cornet, the single voice of the left hand is played on the cromorne, and the final voice is played by the pedal. The fugue subject itself is derived from the chant that we heard in the pedal of the previous plein jeu. The pedal voice in Grigny's fugue may not look like much compared with a German Baroque fugue, but it's significantly more complicated than the majority of French classic organ music. Because French classic organs evolved with the expectation that the pedal division would be used primarily to play plain chant melodies in long notes, as we heard in the preceding plage, there was no need for pedal boards to facilitate virtuoso pedal playing. French classic pedal boards feature relatively small keys that are separated from one another and are arrayed on a flat angled board. It's easy to play long note chant melodies on this style of pedal board, but a fugue subject that needs to be shaped more intricately is much more challenging. Here again, Grigny takes a standard French classic form and stretches it to its maximum potential. Two-thirds of the way through the piece, there is a stark shift in character. 
Instead of piled on subject entries rife with ornaments, all of a sudden we start to see a series of eighth note scales in the manuals over a seven measure rest in the pedal. In measure 36, at the middle of this section, we come to an interesting moment where manuscript sources disagree with one another. The three major manuscript sources for the Grigny Livre d'Orgue come to us from three important organists. The composer himself, Johann Gottfried Walter, and Johann Sebastian Bach. These sources differ on several occasions, and it is not always a simple thing to decide which is most likely to be correct. In the fugue of Grigny's Ave Maristella, we have one such occurrence. On the fourth beat of measure 36, where Grigny gives a B natural in the alto voice, Bach gives a B flat. Let's listen to the difference that changing this one note makes in the musical phrase, first with a B natural and then with a B flat. Next up is a sprightly duo. As we discussed in our first episode, duos are registered with either the jeu de tierce alone or with the jeu de tierce played against either a cromorne or a trumpet. Today, you will hear Grigny's duo with the right hand on the jeu de tierce of the positif and the left hand on the jeu de tierce of the grand orgue. Grigny's duo makes extensive use of hemiola. While hemiola is not rare in the French classic era, it is perhaps not typical to find it used five distinct times within one short verset. This creates a playful nature that pairs well with a duo's flamboyant registration. Grigny ends this duo with a series of flourishes in the right hand, which serve to momentarily suspend time. Indeed, the effect of these runs is similar to the many hemiolas in that it subverts the overall meter of the verset. In the final five measures of the piece, flourishes, ornaments, dotted rhythms, and hemiola all work together to delight the listener with an exciting conclusion. Grigny's Ave Maristella ends with a stunning dialogue sur le grand jeu that both fits precisely into its standard form and excels beyond it. Grigny opens this verset with three series of flourishes, each one faster than the one before, first eighth notes, then sixteenth notes, and finally thirty-second notes. <laughs> opening is followed with an exchange between the petit jeu 
and the grand jeu, in which each hand takes a turn acting as soloist. And as the end of the verset approaches, we are given alternation between not just two keyboards, but four, the grand jeu, the petit jeu, a cornet, and an echo. Once again, Grigny has taken a standard form and stretched it to its maximum potential. I hope that you have enjoyed this introduction to the music of Nicolas de Grigny, and I hope you will continue on to our other two episodes, which feature the stunning music of François Couperin and Pierre Dumage. I also encourage you to begin reading about French classic organ music. Two books that are a fantastic introduction to this style are The Language of the Classical French Organ by Fenner Douglas and Organ and Interpretation, the French École Classique by Paolo Crivellaro. The music of the French Baroque is astoundingly rich in color, expression, and creativity. I hope these three episodes help to give you some tools so that you can begin your own exploration of this wonderful music. <laughs>